So then, again, I've mentioned relative risk before, and this is extraordinary to me that people get away with this. Um, what relative risk means is, again, we're talking about a 1% benefit. So let's say 2% um, of your people on placebo have a heart attack and 1% on the Lipitor have a heart attack, which I think is very important to realize. That means if you do nothing, you have a 98% chance of not having a heart attack. And I think it's very important for people. It's <laughs> impressive, isn't it? And I'm getting this directly from the studies. I'm not making this up. Um, I mean, most of the studies you're looking at, about 96 to 98 percent of the people do not have a heart attack, and almost all of them do not die. Okay, so we begin there. But then when we look at the two percent to one percent, the real difference then is a one percent difference. But what will you see in ads? What will you see sold to the doctors in their training? What will you see told to people? And this is often the only statistic you will see is that this Lipitor reduces heart attacks by 50%. That 50% means you're going from two to one. So the one is half of two, so you say it's a 50% reduction. But that's a distortion of the data because really you're changing it from having a 2% chance of heart attack to 1%. The real difference is 1%. Now, yeah. with that said, I have lectured to physicians because I was at the VA for 30 years and I gave lectures to physicians there and I've lectured at cardiology meetings. The doctors will still say, well, that's better than nothing. So mm -hmm. at least 1% of my people on the statins won't have a heart attack that they would have had had they not been on a statin. And that's a very reasonable thing to say. Absolutely. And I would agree entirely. And I'd say, fine, then people should be on a statin if there were no adverse effects. And this is where pharma has basically had control over to a great extent as to what's reported about adverse effects. But when you actually look deep into the literature, you find adverse effects are prevalent. We actually had a review. I have a review coming out in a public library of science, PLOS One, in which we reviewed over a dozen adverse effects of statins. We've 60 published papers on the adverse effects with the leader the most common adverse effect is the development of type 2 diabetes in healthy people who take statins. And when we're talking about a doubling of the rate of diabetes in people who take statins, not talking about going from 1% to 2%, study very clearly showed that in people getting placebo over the course of about five years, about 5% of them spontaneously develop diabetes. But in those on statins, you're looking at about 10% develop diabetes. So wow. it's an extra 5% of the people who were healthy develop type 2 diabetes, and that can be related then to the statin that they're taking. Yeah, it's uh, really compelling stuff. And, you know, when we, if we circle back to that discussion around LDL cholesterol, because obviously things have now shifted away from total cholesterol, statins also lower LDL cholesterol, um, the supposed bad cholesterol, as you mentioned, and obviously claim to lead to hardening and narrowing of the arteries um, because obviously it's acting as a as a ferry or water taxi delivering you know fat molecules to cell so could you circle back and talk a little bit more about your research in this space on LDL and that recent systematic review in the British Medical Journal sure so um, the review that I had the great pleasure to write with over a dozen um, MDs including cardiologists uh, we reviewed every paper that had been published on coronary mortality, all-cause mortality in older people. Basically, you're talking about people who have the greatest likelihood of dying from heart disease. That's all people over 60 years of age. We did not find a single paper that showed premature mortality in people with the highest levels of LDLC. And in fact, the vast majority of the people that were studied, that's older people with the highest LDL, showed greater longevity than people with low LDL. And so that was actually the, uh, the first study that specifically our review targeted studies on LDL and showed, in fact, that if you have high LDL, you can expect to live longer than if you have low LDL. And related to this, again, getting back to familial hypercholesterolemia, these are people who have cholesterol that's like 400 is their total cholesterol, and their LDLC is about 250. And the American Heart Association recommends you be below 100. These are people at more than two times the level of LDLC. 
And I covered this in a recent review. We have a paper on familial hypercholesterolemia in which if you're 60 years of age, you actually have a lower rate of death and no greater increase in cardiovascular disease if your LDL is 250 and your total cholesterol is over 400. This, will, this really surprises people. Um, but what people really need to understand is LDL was not created to simply to block people's arteries. LDL is an essential part of our health. It's an important part of our immune system. People with the highest levels of LDL have one-tenth the rate of cancer that people with low LDLs have. Um, people have significantly lower inflammatory disease and immune disease, people with the highest level of cholesterol. And that's often what kills older people would be infection. So people need to understand that high LDL is actually healthy. The last thing you would want to do is muck with your LDL since it's actually associated with longer life and better health. Terrific. And, and David, what about particle number? You know, studies indicate that risk for atherosclerosis is you know, more related to the number of LDL particles than the total amount of cholesterol uh, within these particles. So you know, right. could you shed some light on how that relates to heart disease? Yeah, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you asked about this. And in fact, uh, I just gave a talk um, a couple of weeks ago at the University of Houston at a low-carb meeting, and I covered LDLC versus LDLP. So what's happened is the, the, the war on cholesterol had to retreat from total cholesterol, which failed as a mark of heart disease, to LDLC, which is a measure of total cholesterol within the LDL, uh, now to LDLP. Um, so what you've got is um, LDL is packaged in a lipoprotein, and you can actually monitor and measure each lipoprotein itself by actually counting the number of ApoB particles. Each LDL has one ApoB particle, uh, but the amount of cholesterol inside the particle can change. That's the LDLC. So a paper came out some years ago, and there's been some support for this that shows a better correlation of coronary events to LDLP instead of LDLC. Well, I actually lectured on this, and I showed that the people who have higher LDLP um, are the ones actually that have higher blood sugar, they're more likely to smoke, they have more diabetes, more metabolic syndrome, dramatically higher triglycerides. I mean, doesn't this tell you something, it means that LDLP is another marker of an unhealthy lifestyle. If a person has high blood sugar and they happen to also have high LDLP, why would you want to conclude that it's LDLP that causes the heart disease? The high blood sugar, the high triglycerides, the low HDL, these are all markers of an unhealthy lifestyle. So all this thing, all this going on about LDLP is simply because LDLC has failed. And so what the lipidologists are looking for is another lipid that can be blamed for causing heart disease. But it's simply a surrogate marker for an unhealthy lifestyle. So if you want to change your LDLP, you want to change your HDL, your triglycerides, you want to be able to reduce diabetes, and you basically want to improve performance in sports as well, is basically cut back on the sugar, um, go low carb, and increase consumption of fat. Um, it's, it's frankly the best way to optimize all biomarkers. Yeah, it's a great point of uh, you know using that LDLP as as a surrogate marker for that lifestyle and lifestyle medicine and changing those things around nutrition and movement and whether it's sleep or stress management and those things. So that's uh, really insightful. And you know, Doc, I um, Prof, rather, I, I recently had a chance to listen to uh, Dr. Peter Atia's in depth discussion with uh, lipidologist Thomas Dayspring. Which you know, I think it was about five lectures worth of uh, you know, pretty deep dive into this sort of conversation. And you know, they had talked around things like ApoB, apolipoprotein B, and of course LP little A in this whole uh, discussion on, on on heart health. You know, can you talk to listeners a little bit more about where the research is at at the moment in terms of LP little A? You know, it's a little difficult for me because I listened to their discussion and I. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm I'm holding back because I, I, they're they're two very bright people, two very knowledgeable people, and it's remarkable to me, especially with Peter Atia being an advocate for low carb diet, that they can be so blind to the actual cause of heart disease. Why they both cling to the idea that LDL in some form, whether LDL 
C or LDLP um, actually causes heart disease. They kept saying it over and over. LDLP causes heart disease. And and I, I almost pulled on my hair out. It was really terrible at my age. We pulled my hair out. I couldn't afford to do that. Um, but I was going nuts because they're clearly aware that when you look at the different LDL forms, and, and Ron Krauss has done such nice work on this as well, that what you find is that with high blood sugar, you have, a, in a sense, a shrinking of the LDL. You have the small, dense LDL, which is associated with heart disease. But really the question is, what you want to distinguish between association and causation. LDL, in a sense, is damaged by high blood sugar. It is damaged when people smoke, when people are sedentary, when people are obese. How can you blame a damaged protein, a damaged cholesterol, on causing the disease when what you want to do is get back to the undamaged form? And so the undamaged or native form is one that is not affected when you have high blood sugar. So ultimately it gets to the low-carb diet helps to increase the size of the LDL, which is associated then with less heart disease. So again, I don't understand why these two very bright people just can't seem to get the idea that it's it's stress and blood sugar and sedentary diet and obesity that's contributing to the heart disease. Now, even LP little a, LP little a gets back to the broader scheme that I've lectured on, which has to do with coagulation. Um, people are, of course, accept that a clot can cause a heart attack or a stroke. But what they don't understand is that there are so many different influences, including LP little a, that have to do with clotting from the very beginning to trigger atherosclerosis. And LP little a has to do with fibrinolysis. And so it's related actually to fibrin, it's related actually to clotting. And people with high LP little a actually have reduced fibrinolysis, which is the body has a natural ability to break up clots. And when you have high LP little a, you're impaired at breaking up clots. So again, what do you do? Do you take medication to lower your LPA? No. What you want is a strategy to reduce the likelihood that you're going to naturally be forming clots. And what forms clots, coagulation, uh, activation of your platelets, again, it all gets to high blood sugar, being obese, smoking, stress, all activate platelets. And so we literally have these clots going through our bloodstream as a result of an unhealthy lifestyle. And if we want to get to what actually triggers atherosclerosis, we have a microvasculature in our coronary arteries called the vasovasorum. These are tiny arteries that are relatively easy to get blocked. These are the arteries that actually feed the center of the coronary artery, the intima. And so when these tiny arteries are blocked, and this has been studied, this is my idea, this has been around for decades. When these tiny arteries that feed the inside of the coronary artery, when they get blocked, the inside of the artery, literally, it dies. It becomes necrotic because it's hypoxic. And so what happens at that point is you have to have cholesterol coming in along with white blood cells to repair that tissue. You find bacteria invade the center of the coronary artery. And so the LDL, along with white blood cells, kill the bacteria and remove the viruses. And that is, in fact, how the plaque develops. The plaque develops from death, necrotic tissue, in the middle of the artery. As a result of repeating that process time after time over decades, the artery wall thickens until eventually the lumen, where the blood flows, gets choked off. Or the atheroma, which is that growing plaque, erupts into the artery and then causes a heart attack and people die. So if you're really looking for the cause of heart disease, you've got to look at hypercoagulation and insufficient fibrinolysis. And what's the way to fight both of those? Frankly, it's not with medication. It's not taking aspirin. It's not taking any drug to change that. It is just so easy. And the way to do it is to keep blood sugar low, is to moderate exercise, um, not be sedentary, and certainly not to smoke. This is the ideal way to keep the, those platelets from getting so activated that they block our blood vessels.